download our IELTS preparation app and access unlimited premium practice material for your exam. Part 1 First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. In today's lecture, we'll begin with an overview of the impact of tourism on the societies and cultures of the host area. Then we'll look at some case studies. One model for the socio-cultural impact of tourism has been provided by Doxy. You'll find a reference in your reading list. He called his model the Iridex, that's a contraction of Irritation Index, and it attempts to show how the attitudes of local people to tourists and tourism change over the years. Doxy identifies four stages. He calls the first stage Euphoria, happiness, because initially the tourists are regarded as a novelty and because of this, they're welcomed by everyone in the host area. But as well as that, there's another reason for the people in the host community to welcome tourists. Local people realize that tourism brings scope for economic benefits. As tourist development begins to increase, however, local interest in the visitors becomes sectionalized, that means that some sections of the local population become involved with tourists, while others don't. And it is increasingly the case that commercial rather than social factors are influencing relationships between tourists and the host community. People are less interested in the tourists for their own sake. Doxy calls this stage apathy. If development continues to increase, apathy may change to annoyance. What's causing this? Well, development of the tourist area may start to spiral up out of control, and this is often accompanied by congestion, which is going to make life difficult for local people. So the policymakers, the government, the local authorities and so on, provide more infrastructure for the area, more roads, more car parks and so on, to try to help cope with the influx of tourists. But the lives of the local people are made increasingly difficult, and in the final stage of the model, annoyance has turned to antagonism and open hostility to the tourists. And now, all the detrimental changes to lifestyles in the host area are, fairly or unfairly, seen as due to the tourists. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Well, this sort of pathway is certainly a fairly good reflection of what happens in some tourist destinations. But Doxy's model has drawn a number of criticisms. The most significant is that it suggests a very negative attitude to the socio-cultural effects of tourism. The fact that the model is unidirectional, that it only works in one direction, seems to suggest that decline in the host-visitor relationship 
is inevitable. Now, in practice, fortunately, things aren't always quite like that. If you look at real situations, you'll see that the relationships between local people and tourists are rather more complicated and prone to greater variation than this model suggests. So the model is really rather oversimplified. In fact, studies have highlighted quite a few positive effects of tourism. For example, Doxy's model doesn't look at the effects on the tourists themselves. They may well benefit from increased understanding of the host society and culture. Then, traditional crafts in the host area may be revitalized because tourism provides new markets, such as the souvenir trade, for example. So, instead of these traditional skills being lost, local people are encouraged to develop them. There may also be more long-lasting changes, which actually lead to the empowerment of both groups and individuals in the host area. For example, tourism creates openings for employment for women, and through giving them a chance to have a personal income, it allows them to become more independent. In addition, because tourism tends to work through a very few languages that have worldwide usage, those working in the tourist industry may be encouraged to acquire new languages, and this will empower them through providing wider access to globalized media and improving their job prospects in a wider context. Right, now we'll take a short break there, and then we'll look at a couple of case studies and see how far the points we've discussed so far apply to them. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a presenter on a radio show. The presenter is talking to the organizer of an arts festival. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hi again. I'm joined today by Ben Knightley from the Media and Arts Centre. He's here to tell us about the launch of the city's arts festival. Hi, Ben. This year has a particular focus, doesn't it? It does, yes. This year, we want to encourage more people who would not normally describe themselves as being creative to get involved with some of our many events and workshops. Not simply turning up as spectators, but to get involved themselves, to get their hands dirty, as it were. There's such a wide offering this year that I'm sure we'll have something to suit all tastes. You were telling me earlier how beneficial being creative can be for us. Absolutely. I recently attended a drawing workshop, and uh, even if I do say so myself, came away with a very good sketch I'd done. But what was particularly surprising for me was my feeling of pride and joy when I looked at the sketch again and showed it to the family. It really took me back to the feelings I had as a youngster when I'd made something. I realised that, even as an adult, we can get just as much pleasure and happiness from creative activity. Actually, research has shown that the more we allow ourselves to be creative, the happier we feel. And the more positive our frame of mind, the more creative and the more curious we become about the world we live in. Well, you've certainly persuaded me. 
So what kind of events can we look forward to? We want to try and include as wide a range of people as possible this year, from people already involved in the creative arts through to elderly people who haven't been creative in years. So, for example, we're inviting people in the creative industries who occasionally suffer from writer's block to join us on one of our creative walks. Walking has been proved to aid creative thinking, and we're running a series of walks during the spring and summer around some of the many beauty spots in and around the city. Then there's our knitting program. We're working with schools in the area to invite grandparents in to teach kids how to knit. It's a great opportunity to bridge the generation gap and rekindle that interest in knitting you may have forgotten about. We also aim to inspire and support people without jobs through a series of free courses, starting with creative writing workshops. These courses will give them an insight into the basic ingredients of a good short story and help participants get their ideas into shape. And for anyone out there who is looking for the chance to explore their creative side, come along to our printmaking workshops. You'll have the chance to study some fantastic prints by local artists, explore different print processes, and take home a print of your own to hang on a wall. Before you hear the rest of the radio show, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Excellent. So how do we go about getting involved? If anyone is interested in joining one of these sessions, it's important that you contact us first, as places need to be booked beforehand. We ran similar sessions last year and demand was high. As I said previously, there's no charge for any of the workshops and materials where appropriate will be provided on the day. You can get further information on our website, and if you don't have access to the internet, call us on 514-2261. The booking office is open Monday to Friday from 9 to 5, but closes early on a Saturday at 12.30. Many thanks, Ben. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a university tutor and a student who has recently started at the university. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 25. Anyway, as this is our first session, I'd just like to find out how you're settling in, how your Spanish course is going. Basically, anything you feel you need to talk about. I'm OK, I suppose. I'm settling into my studies and I'm finding the course interesting. I've got a free day on Wednesday, which is good and the lectures and tutorials on the other four days. Yeah, I'm getting into the swing of things. I'm just missing home a little, that's all. OK. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I reckon half the students I speak with are a little homesick. It's only natural. 
Is this the first time you've lived away from home? Yes. I was thinking just this morning that I've never spent so long away from my friends and family before. I've been back home on one occasion since I started in September, but it's so expensive to get down to London by train that I can't go very often. Well, don't be too hard on yourself, Kevin. It's quite a lot to deal with at first, isn't it? Moving to a new city, being responsible for everything for the first time ever, shopping, cooking, etc. Then making new friends, and then there's your studies, of course, and getting organised. Are you living on campus or in town? On campus, in halls of residence. It's not as cheap as renting a room in a house, but I thought it would be a good way of meeting new students. We're all in and out of the kitchen during the day, so it's not difficult to socialise. Like you say, I'm just a bit homesick. I'm sure that you'll find things get better over the next few weeks. Everything's new for you at the moment and a little overwhelming. But you'll get into a routine and start to feel more settled. What about Freshers' Week? Did you sign up for anything? Yes, I've joined a couple of groups. There's the Film Society and a tutor recommended the Spanish Society, so I've signed up for that too. I've volunteered to help out on their International Food Day, making snacks, that kind of thing. And I'm looking forward to getting to know other members. You said earlier you were finding your studies OK, so that's good as well. The main thing to remember is to try to be as organised as possible. You have so much more freedom to make your own decisions here, so it's important to structure your time to factor in time for studies. If you're on top of your work, you'll feel much more able to enjoy your free time. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Um, I was hoping you could help me with my essay writing. I seem to be spending ages writing and rewriting essays and, well... The best bet is for you to sign up to the University Writing Tutorial Service. They have people who are in place to support students specifically with these problems. To join, just fill in the application form and give them a sample of your work. Brilliant. I didn't know anything about that. Can I give them one of my essays to look at? They won't give you feedback on a complete essay, I'm afraid, as they may not be subject experts. It's really aimed at developing your academic writing skills. Ideally, you should write something between 1,000 to 1,500 words. If you find their page on the university website, they've got a list of general topics you can try. So, do I just turn up, or do I need to make an appointment? I've got an essay deadline coming up soon, so I'd like to get help as soon as possible. You'll need to arrange an appointment. The first step is to sign up for the service. Download the application form and essay title from the web page. Don't forget to state when you're available for tutorials on the form. Email the essay and form to the team, and they'll get back to you with an appointment time. It usually takes about one week from when they first receive your essay to arrange an appointment. You're usually given one tutorial a term, but they may offer you further sessions if they think you need them. OK, I'll do that. Thanks for your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk given by a guest lecturer in the continuing education department. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good evening. I'd like to thank the Continuing Education Department for hosting this series of lectures on people behind the names you thought were fiction. Welcome to this talk on the Grand Old Duke of York. I'm sure you're all familiar with the old nursery rhyme, "The Grand Old Duke of York, he had ten thousand men." He marched them up to the top of the hill, and he marched them down again, and so on. But did you know that the Duke of York, immortalized in this popular song, was actually Frederick Augustus, second son of King George the Third of England and Queen Charlotte? He achieved fame in this way because of the humiliation he suffered at the hands of the French during the Revolutionary Wars at the end of the eighteenth century. Frederick was born on the sixteenth of August, seventeen sixty-three, and from the age of seventeen he had been trained as a soldier. When war broke out between England and France in seventeen ninety-three, his father, the king, insisted that he should command the British contingent that was being dispatched to Flanders to cooperate with the Austrians and the Dutch. The duke was a brave soldier, but remember he was only thirty at the time. Not only was he young, but he was also inexperienced in battle, and was unable to cope with the enthusiastic French Revolutionary Army. He was let down by his allies too, and in spite of the arrival of ten thousand fresh troops from England, his campaigns were a disaster. He was driven out of Dunkirk in September 1793, Flanders in May 1794, and Belgium in July 1794. Finally, during the winter of seventeen ninety four to seventeen ninety five, his army retreated to the border of Hanover, and, with his unsuccessful campaigns over, the duke returned to England. It was after this military fiasco that the Duke of York came to be, rather unkindly, satirized in song. Would you believe, despite all this? King George the Third arranged his son's promotion to the position of Commander in Chief of the Army in 1798, and in the following year he was appointed to command an army sent to invade Holland. Again, he was unsuccessful, and this confirmed the general opinion that he was not capable of commanding an army in the field. Nevertheless, the rhyme is a bit cruel and harsh, because it doesn't take into account the nature of the soldiers who served with Frederick. All the blame for lack of success should not have been attached to the duke alone, because the army he had under his command was made up from what is commonly described as the scum of the earth. This is a somewhat offensive term used to refer to a group of people regarded as despicable and worthless. Who were they, these ordinary soldiers? Well, they were mostly vicious, brutal ex-convicts or raw recruits. And elderly men, the officers who commanded them were all untrained as military men. In fact, they were anybody who could afford to buy a commission.、Uh, but here's the really great thing that, unfortunately, the Duke of York is not remembered for. He realised that this was a hopeless kind of army, and he set about improving conditions in order to recruit higher quality soldiers. He introduced padres. Are you familiar with the term? No, well, let me explain. You see, members of the British armed forces are generally Christians of one denomination or another, and a padre is a Christian cleric or chaplain who ministers to the soldiers and attends to their spiritual needs, 
without belonging to any particular grouping within the Christian faith. Now, where was I? Yes, Frederick introduced padres, doctors, and veterinary surgeons to the battlefield. Why vets? To attend to the horses, of course. Remember we're talking about late 18th century battlefields. He was also the founder of the Royal Military College for the training of officers at Sandhurst. Yes, the very same one where the princes and other members of the royal family receive their military training today. Frederick also founded the Duke of York's school in London for sons of soldiers killed in battle. His name is perhaps better commemorated by this school in Chelsea than by the column that stands at the top of Waterloo Steps in St. James's Park. In 1807, the Duke was involved in a scandal with a woman and, as a result, resigned as Commander-in-Chief. But he was reinstated in 1811 by his elder brother, the Prince Regent, who later became George IV of England. He continued in this post until his death in 1827. That is the end of Part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.